Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for episode four of season five of the Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. We have had two amazing guests so far, and you've also heard a little bit about us in episode (laughs) three, and I'm so excited about the guests that we have lined up for this season. That's right. We'll be talking to guests with research and creative interest in areas that we haven't learned about so far. And so, Kim, I've got a question for you. I've always got a question. Always a question. <laughs> okay, so do you or anyone in your family have old copies of photographs or videos that were taken decades ago when you were younger? So the answer is sort of. My grandfather was an amateur photographer, and he used slide film. And I'm going to put a definition of what (laughs) slides are in the show notes for those of you who are not familiar. And he has these amazing photographs from the 1950s on. I mean, amazing. Um, But not a single one has been digitized. They are literally sitting in slide trays (laughs) in the home where my parents lived. But who has a slide projector? So the only way you can look at them is pull them out of the slide tray and hold it up to light. Mm -hmm. Um, My dad was also an amateur photographer, so I do come by that skill, honestly. And when he was taking pictures, he processed his negatives and the prints. And again, I'll put a note in the show notes about what negative is and film (laughs) processing. Um, So I feel like we have trays of slides and Mm -hmm. photo albums of pictures, but I don't think we have any video at all. Um, but I certainly wish we had it digitized and in one place. So that's my exciting childhood in a nutshell, no digital representation of my existence. What about you? Surely your family did better. Uh, not, not too much better. <laughs> um, but that, that kind of sounds amazing. Like no digital representation. Nope. nope. <laughs> so not I at all. <laughs> slide sitting around in my like, um, and I, and I have this, this thing in my save for later, like bucket or cart or whatever on Amazon, that's one of those, it's a, I don't, a contraption, a, a, a thing that converts slides to pictures. And ooh, I don't know if that's what digitizing is. I don't know if it spits something out or if it like goes to a cloud or I, I don't know. It's too expensive for me to purchase right now. So I haven't actually <laughs> seen what it does. But it looks cool, and when it's $5, I'm totally buying it, and I will let you know. Please do. Please like, do. I have a camcorder. I, I think I still have it somewhere. I think Ooh. I have VHS, VHS type things <laughs> that I videoed something on, but I'm not sure that I want those digitized. <laughs> Slightly off the exact topic, but I'll go here anyway. So I took public speaking as an undergrad and we had to bring in a videotape for our speeches. So we had to record them and then reflect on them and critique ourselves. And thank goodness I'm old because now in our classes, those speeches definitely go to a cloud. I threw away my tape. Not only (laughs) throw it it away, but I like broke it so that it could not be viewed anymore. Okay, back to the real topic. (laughs) Our next guest takes us into the world of digital preservation and the need for digital preservation as a means of making old things new to a degree. And most importantly, making all kinds of files and information accessible to everyone. If you think beyond home movies and photos and slides that we might have lying around and you shift to things um, like films created for organizations or groups, you might have a lot of history documented somewhere that so many more people need to know about, but they don't because it hasn't been digitized and and made accessible. And this is what today's guest is going to tell us all about, not only what he does, but why it's important and how some of the work truly can help others learn about culture and people and other ways of knowing. Yep, that's right. And what our next guest says is that we can actually create community through archival research. And the ways all kinds of files are revised and repurposed. 
So you're in for a treat. Please join us in welcoming today's guest, Dr. Demetrius Latsis, an assistant professor in the School of Library and Information Studies. Welcome, Welcome. Demetrius. Demetrios, oh. thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to have you as a guest on the Revised. And thank you for having me. I'm a fan of the show and uh, of the ICAR as well. well yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Demetrios, we are going to start off with some rapid fire, quick response questions. Well, I was going to ask you your name, but we already know that. <laughs> Where are you from? <laughs> And it is super Greek, so you are able to <laughs> tell from that that I'm from Greece. So, <laughs> okay, more details. Where yeah, in Greece are you from? So the south of the mainland, uh, not really anything very touristy. Although you know, this summer was I, I was there up until two weeks ago, and um, so I grew up there in the Peloponnese, is the peninsula that it's called, and um, I came for college to the states. So two <laughs> years back now. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, tell us what you are doing now. Uh, so this semester or uh, at, at the UA more generally? In your life. In your life. Yeah. What, what is your what is your job now? OK, well, so I'm, I'm, I'm only my, in my second year at UA and I'm thrilled to kind of be in a program, which is exactly the niche I wanted, which is not very, uh, very easy to find. Uh, my specialty is more in um, digital and audiovisual preservation. And so uh, UA, along with UCLA, actually, is the only other program that offer an MLIS in the Library Information Studies school that we are here uh, that has this option for audiovisual material uh, and their preservation. So uh, that's my kind of job job. So I coordinate the uh, EBSCO scholars project uh, program within uh, SLIS and um, otherwise I'm kind of uh, conducting research and with the support of ICIR <laughs> including <laughs> last year the uh, grant writing workshop that was very very helpful and um, also mentoring students uh, taking care of their internships and, and, and different opportunities so uh, yeah I'm excited to get to know uh, the college better now. Obviously, we have a new dean, and uh, uh, and um, uh, also one of the kind of medium term goals that I have is to build a small lab um, that we have been talking about, uh, uh, specialized in digital preservation with kind of older formats, and have the students be able to get some hands on training on that. Nice. Okay, so you have told us a lot of things, and I can't wait to dive a little bit deeper into many of these. But mm -hmm. I have to ask. When you were a young boy in Greece, what did the young Demetrio see himself doing? Did you always say, I'm going to be a professor? Or was there <laughs> something else that you wanted to do? Oh, that's interesting. I, I remember kind of being excited by newscasters, you know, how they would kind of get this pose and get in front of the camera and deliver the news and have this catchphrase and everything. And so that's what I thought I would, I, I mean, if I, I guess what JCM is doing more within, within the CNIS context is, yeah, so I remember kind of being very much into that. I would rehearse in front of the mirror and... <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so what were you rehearsing? Did you write your own little news story and then practice stand up? We do. So we would record, remember the tapes, you know, the Google <laughs> fashion, you know, mixtapes we would make. I remember with my cousin would make shows. We would kind of like go back and edit it and write over the thing manually. Right. I mean, it, so, yeah, we did a fair amount of that and, and write little scripts. And I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this summer I was trying to locate some of that material, which is, you know, kind of very hilarious. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we'd okay. like to get our hands on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I there is some at least there's photos, and um, <laughs> it's funny because like I'm doing this for a living, right? And I can't like at home we didn't have any tape players, so for me to be able to play these back, the recordings, so I would have to bring them here and see how I can get the content out of them, mm -hmm. right? I mean. <laughs> Okay, so I want to get into maybe this, but maybe segue a little bit. Uh -huh. You've talked about 
preservation and yes. kind of what you do. Can you give us maybe an elevator pitch or just like, wh- what do you mean by digital preservation? Yes. And I know it can seem kind of like an oxymoron, right? I mean, <laughs> digital, <laughs> since so far as digital is like so ephemeral and so huge. So how do you preserve that? And so I think for me, if I can provide you know, brief reason why I do. I caught the bug. Uh, I was doing a postdoc at the Internet Archive. And many of you will be familiar with this institution that is preserving the web, but also scanning books and and movies and a lot of other things. And so that's what where it hit me that you know I can combine my passion for good old analog. You know, I'm very much a paper old book kind of guy and so forth <laughs> with these older with these newer technologies, right? Tools that mm-hmm. can be used to make these older forms of heritage more accessible. Uh, and so that's what it is. I'm saying that we're using very new cutting edge things to make uh, very old things accessible um, mm. for a wider public. Uh, and very much also my whole spiel is inspired by this access first mentality. I mean, you know, and my, the mentors that I've had over the years were people that were very kind of uh, supportive of that, that, you know, it, it's all about access. It's all about people and not this kind of rarefied world of, uh, you know, museum older, you know, we don't touch, we don't kind of, <laughs> hmm. so, yeah. Okay. So I have, I have a follow-up. Can mm-hmm. you give us an example? You said that you take cutting edge things to make things more accessible. Can you yes. break it down even more and kind of, provide an example of that for our listeners? Absolutely. And, you know, a couple of projects that I work uh, at the Internet Archive uh, were um, uh, to make older films, educational films, you know, those films that we'd see in after school specials or even <laughs> the old 60 millimeter projector in the classroom back in the day. And so get these. And since, you know, people don't have a 60 millimeter projector at home anymore, uh, try to digitize them and put them up. But then the question becomes, okay, so how does someone find them if they don't know exactly what they're looking for? Yeah, mm-hmm, which is the mm-hmm. eternal uh, dilemma <laughs> here. And so, you know, there's various ways to go about that with, uh, you know, manual or human kind of curation uh, with subject tags or, you know, kind of find a way to automate the, the, the way that these are entitled uh, through WorldCat and other centralized databases. But equally crucial is there are the more new technologies that um, provide transcripts, for instance. So we did this grant a while back with uh, some colleagues from Dartmouth and the University of Maine, where we uh, took these films and run them through a automatic kind of voice recognition and they generated transcripts, right? Mm-hmm. And so these are paired with the film so that people are able to search and go wherever, in whatever segment they want. And mind you, this is not just for general kind of uh, interest. There's folks that are making documentaries or want footage of a certain kind, right? So they were able to kind of find a scene within the film uh, and not kind of know, have to know what they're looking for. And then the even kind of next step to that is um, a visual kind of recognition. So, right, uh, the uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that have up to now been trained more on uh, sort of HD video, like sports and stuff to recognize, okay, this is a tennis ball, this is a, you know, outdoor scene and so forth. So we try to mm-hmm. implement that into mm-hmm. these older films, which is much harder because of the quality. And and that automatically adds a lot of value in this um, recording. So I like how our project was entitled Unlocking Film Libraries. Mm. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. That may be so, your title um, of this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, so that's one thing. And I, what I tell my students also is sometimes you can kill two birds with one stone, right? When when you have, for instance, accessibility, right? You have closed captioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the Internet Archive, and since then, I have worked a lot with broadcasting archives, right? We have a partnership here at UA with the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. WGBH that basically scans old television and radio recordings from all around the country and makes them available at AmericanArchive.org. Uh, and so the, the stations, as you know, by law are obligated to have human generated, so i.e. Mm-hmm. good quality, right? Closed mm-hmm. caption 
And so that can be repurposed as a search tool, right? And so <laughs> when you have it up online, you can use that to search for something very, very specific. And so that is both beneficial for folks that need accessibility and for everybody else that needs to find stuff more easily. So, okay. So first of all, th I think, so if you asked me, like, tell me about like archives, I'd be like, wah, wah, I don't know. It doesn't <laughs> sound fun to me. But right. like, you're, I, I am loving this because you're <laughs> making like, a, a, I can tell that you like doing this right. um, just from how you're talking. And that makes me like, want to know more. Yes. So, yes. I, yes. Is, yes. This is very cool. So I have a question for you. Sure. Yes. Are you, when you do this type of work, mm -hmm. is the fun and is the the challenge and the excitement, does that come from the, the methods that you're using mm -hmm. or the outcome that you find or that you like you you do the mm -hmm. preservation or is it the doing of the preservation that is like the most fun? That, that's a good, and I have never thought of it, you know, in terms of most fun. I mean, the bug for me is discovering content when for mm. myself, kind of seeing things that, you know, if I'd fallen through the cracks or, you know, marginalized or so might be the first to have seen it in many years. But I think that's the first step, right? And that mm -hmm. is, right? It might be a quick high of discovery, as you all know, when we go to the archives. And, but I think the more enduring fun is when someone emails you and say, oh, hey, and I still get those emails six years after I've moved on from that institution. You know, hey, you, I saw you put up online that video. Where do you find it? Like, how mm -hmm. can we find more? Ah. So that, that they're seeing the impact, right? Mm. Uh, of things. Or maybe we also had, we were scanning all their home movies. And so we've had a couple of gentlemen that were, didn't even know and they were just fishing around and they found stuff that their family was in. And so that was the amazing kind of high actually mm. uh, when you connect people with stuff that they didn't even know existed anymore. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I have another follow-up and that tends to be how <laughs> sure. these conversations go. We ask a question and then have 29 follow-ups. <laughs> um, so based on what you're describing, it, it mm -hmm. kind of sounds like there's tremendous impact from the work that you do not only in a in a scholarly context but like in real world accessibility context so can you speak to that specifically absolutely and i think you know i i as a youngster or as a grad student let's say i was kind of very cynical about what you just said not that i didn't realize <laughs> its value but i'll give you an example like when when i was in iowa they instituted this new a requirement for our the uh, dissertations that apart from our you know, scientific abstract, we should also have a public interest abstract, right? So that would be a description that would say to the taxpayers of Iowa, right? How does my research into early cinema benefit the taxpayer of Iowa? I was like very kind of <laughs> rescue, you know, uh, cynical about this is kind of like a reductionist and all that. But since then, especially through being in museums and archives, because these are institutions that work with the public and have this interface. And um, as I said, one of my mentors is Rick Prelinger, who it, it comes from a non-academic background, and he organizes a lot of these outreach screenings where people see home movies and they, you know, it creates community around that. So that got me thinking, and I have now kind of flipped to the other side, you know, completely where <laughs> I say, I always question whatever I do as to what, kind of impact it can have. And I can tell you, for instance, you know, the things that I have done that are satisfying to me in terms of outreach are when I have programmed a screening at a festival or, mm -hmm. you know, wow. sort of organized an event, uh, that sort of thing, rather than an article that I put out. And it is important to me because it is what I'm interested in, but, you know, maybe 20, 30 people in the world are going to read. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and there's other things too. I think, you know, Again, this idea of discovering stuff that has been underrated, like this recent project we're working on, and I have, you know, a couple of grants out to see, you know, whether it can be supported is with Tuskegee. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and HBCU institution here in Alabama, uh, they have a very, very rich audiovisual collection. I think very few people know about it, right? I mean, George Washington Carver, all these rare recordings, Booker T. Washington, and you know, how do you get that known? You know, and, and sustainable also, because a lot of these projects, that's the problem is 
they fizz out and they're novelties that don't go anywhere. And so I want to guard against that as well. Okay. So I, I, here's the follow-up for me there mm-hmm. is how do you make, how do you make this stuff known? I mean, are you standing right. out the steps of Reese Pfeiffer saying, hello, mm-hmm. I've got an archive that you need to, <laughs> you need to hear. I've got some recordings. What, what do you do to, to get it out there once you've made this discovery? That, well, that's a good question because it's not, I, my experience has been, it's not you build it and then they come, you know, mm. unless you have a major platform that already has traction, you know, and, and there are, like I said, websites that are more aggregators, you know, so mm. the um, American Archive of Public Broadcasting is such an aggregator, right? You might have heard of DPLA. Digital Public Library of America, and mm. so linking and including your materials into those is a, you know drives traffic and it makes it much more accessible. But of course, you know there's community that you have to cover everybody. You, you can't, you know, assume that people are going to have access to fast speed internet or even the time to. And so I think that's where you have to go to the communities where they are. And I like, <laughs> you know, a good example of that is. Uh, something that colleagues at the Texas um, Archive of the Moving Image have done in the past, which is they've gone out to people and they host these things called roundups. Of course, it's Texas. And so it's the <laughs> film, <laughs> film roundup. Uh, so they go and they have people bring in old stuff, movies, recordings, and so forth. They help them to, you know, kind of clean them and digi- they show them how to take care of them. And so they digitize and then they're asked if, you know, they can be shared with the archive. And I think that that's kind of a wonderful way to give get people to have a stake so you simultaneously get them involved in donating so you get content but you Mm -hmm. also have them be uh, users of it you know Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the other thing I was just talking about it to my students yesterday I think one of the things we're waking up to as archivists is you know in being proactive and reaching out to communities is inviting people to reuse and repurpose stuff Mm -hmm remix you know so I, and i think younger students get it right it, it, mm-hmm. it, 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 there's of course all sorts of issues with copyright and so forth but i think when you activate the material in a new art project or film or uh, you know or journalist or podcast like this one that's when i think it really comes to life mm. uh, so i think kind of inviting creative people not just artists but any kind of creative person to to play in the in their um in your sandbox is, is exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember in, uh, again, in San Francisco, we commissioned DJ Spooky, who is a <laughs> <laughs> DJ uh, here in, in Atlanta, actually. Uh, well, not here, I'm not in Atlanta, but they <laughs> do, <laughs> to do a VJ session with mm-hmm. old educational films. Like he made a wonderful piece that I can uh, sh- uh, send you a link for that mm-hmm. was projected live. And, and it was very exciting to people to to see that combination of, sound and found footage wow (laughs) okay so i have two questions um and the one is probably pretty quick and easy you still have family in greece is that correct yeah that's right yes so (laughs) do you ever find your family saying okay Demetrios, what do you do again? <laughs> like, do, do your family members know and understand what you do? And do they get the relevance of it? Or they're just like, oh, he's over, you know, collecting mm. things. <laughs> and this is really the, you know, $10,000 question. Can you break it down so that your grandma, you know, when she was yes. old, can understand what you do? I think, you know, in my previous position, uh, in, in Toronto, where I taught for four years, because I was in a film school, um, they could understand it better. And so, but again, the presumption was that, are you making films or like, mm-hmm. are you, what are you, and that was, so, but they kind of got that I'm an audiovisual sort of person and that's, now, again, they get the library bit, you know, and the <laughs> archive bit, but they don't have this notion of <laughs> exactly what, um, uh, although I will say my dad kind of uh, kind of occurred to me when I was starting university in Greece, I went to school for computer engineering. So that was my first kind of major, which I never finished. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still probably somewhere in their archives that, you know, as a student. But um, and so he kind of brought that to my attention that in doing all that stuff with newer technologies, I'm kind of coming back to this original 
intention that I had, which was never only about computers. It was about using them to do other stuff, right? To do mm -hmm. cult cultural, you know. Uh, so I think that's what they get. They do, they do get that, you know, the technology, but harness for sort of community and sort of, you know, humanistic kind of purposes. Um, but yeah, it's always a challenge, as you know. No, I, I just, I, I think it's funny because for academics, for us, what we do mm -hmm. just seems so simple and straightforward. But then like when your mom, like, yes, what, what do you do? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... And it's so cute. Your tracks, I think, I think if you take it in a good way, and if they mean it in a good way, it can help you clarify a little bit. What is, what is the end game? What is it that mm -hmm. you want mm -hmm. to achieve, right? That, that has, uh, and I know you guys do work that, that, is at the intersectional of health and and uh, and uh, education and so forth and and that is perhaps more immediately impactful right I mean it's it's more evident to people um, and so it's all about finding those intersections and these partnerships I think mm. that's that, mm -hmm. that's what has benefited me the most whenever I work with with partners it, it forces me to kind of uh, be more uh, deliberate about what it is I want to achieve yeah yeah okay so here's part two of the question but it's okay completely different um, <laughs> so you've talked about some pretty cool things that you've done over the over the course of your your career as of right now what would you consider to be your m most proud accomplishment what are you most proud of that's you know and again i try to put you on this spot this without I'm seeming sorry. too con <laughs> conceited or i think I mean, the tra there's the traditional bucket. I, I mean, let me let me kind of say the traditional what I'm supposed to say in a, as an academic, and then I'm maybe <laughs> say something that's <laughs> sentimentally important to me. Um, so I think the thing that I'm most proud of uh, as an academic is, you know, like I have my book, uh, which it, it was a big risk for me deciding not to do my dissertation as a book, mm. uh, but rather to do it as chapters and in journals and so forth, which I've, I've done almost all of it. But, you know, I thought I, I'm, I get bored too easily. And so, you know, like I, the day after I defended my dissertation, I literally said, okay, I'm going to start a new project. I said like a palate cleanser or something. And seven years later that, you know, kind of book, <laughs> I signed a contract uh, last month actually. And Woo! You know, yeah, with Oxford, with Oxford and it's going to come out at some point, you know, in 23 it, and so, you know, that's satisfying because it's kind of a debt that paid off and that was, I wasn't sure it was going to pan out. And actually, you know, to be completely honest, a different press that was much less prestigious than Oxford passed on it. And, and you know, so it is the satisfaction to see that come to fruition in, in a way that originally envisioned rather than have it to stretch and, you know, kind of make it contort itself to be something that it, I don't want it to be. But I think the most important thing for me and sentimentally and as a person is that the other risk I took in, to, in coming to the States at a very young age with really very little, you know, not, not language and so forth because I spoke, but a different major. So, you know, mm -hmm. computer engineering going into cinema, right? Very little financial support and, and very few people I knew. And, and a combination of things, you know, the fact that I felt that I was 22 and starting a new bachelor degree from scratch when I hadn't anything, you know. And so the fact that, that I managed to do that pivot effectively and show to the people that care about me and so forth that I was able to kind of have this diversity of interest and it wasn't kind of, master of all trades uh, or jack of all trades master of none right <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that is very affirming i think you know people credit that whenever i talk now of course that said it's an ongoing story right you never say someone is successful until the very last day or <laughs> of their lives in a way but um it's all work in progress i suppose well, I think I I think that we can say you have been successful, and I think yes, <laughs> get give yourself that credit. Don't wait till the end. I think that's important to do. Yes, and I that's what I tell to my students as well. Is you mm -hmm. know every little bit of affirmation. I think I'm also getting to that age. I think you know you know this feeling much better than I do. Where the successes I don't have children yet, but the successes of people I mentor mean much more to me. Not in a, in a very yeah. self-serving <laughs> yeah. way, 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not altruistic, you know, I mean, I try hard at it, but I think when someone, you trigger something in their interest and then they come back a few years later and they say, okay, I got this internship or this job and so forth. I think that's exciting, much more exciting than, than me publishing something or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Okay, I have one one extra question for you here. Okay, <laughs> might be, go for it. It might be a fun one. It might be a silly one. So, uh, will will everything at some point be preserved? Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Do things like are we are are you going to find yourself doing work in like TikTok preservation? <laughs> <laughs> Well, or already we, there so is uh, there's on. certainly social media and Twitter and so forth preservation. <laughs> so, um, and uh, but, you know, it is difficult because we have found ourselves in a situation where there's big co companies that control a lot of content that people produce mm. on a daily basis, and they don't have it necessarily open access. The, these these uh, the code behind these platforms is not such that it can facilitate copying. And so, outside of the fact that it's this huge mass of things, that how do you go about making it accessible? Because I think the next frontier is, is discoverability and accessibility. It's not about whether we can, let's say we have the capacity on the servers and the technology to capture all that and save it. But if it's an ocean of content mm -hmm. and you get drowned and lost in that, then mm -hmm. it, you know, you bury in the haystack. It's, it's not, it, you know, it's, you might as well not have done anything. So, you know, that's, that's the, more, the bigger question. I always tell my students, you know, who assume that, of course, everything, every film ever made is already online and you don't need to do anything. <laughs> um, that, you know, to, to sort of look again and see what are some of the assumptions about what gets preserved and who makes mm -hmm. that call, right? What mm -hmm. makes that choice? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've written down at least four things that would make great titles for this episode. So okay. thank you for all of that. <laughs> um, all right. We are getting to the wrap up section of this episode. But before we actually wrap it up, we want to make sure we end this with some recommendations from oh, you. Yes. Okay. So what is your favorite TV show or what are you watching right now? Ooh, uh, let me, I, I, I'll tell you what I'm watching right now. And I went into that rabbit hole of <laughs> schadenfreude, you know, <laughs> which is just, you know, I enjoy seeing big failures and, I mean, of people who are, you know, to kind of maybe to serve themselves, not in academia, mind you, because the stakes are super low in academia, but uh, I, I, I kind of got the bug of all these uh, founder tech CEO uh, shows. Do you know what I'm talking about? Over the spring and summer, they had the one about Theranos. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The one about Uber, and then the one about... Um, this guy in New York with the um, uh, the rentals of the real estate. So, you know, workspace, you know, you you work, you, we crashed. The show was called We Crashed. Mm. Um, so I watched these all back to back to back. And, you know, again, it leaves you, I thought it was going to be very satisfying. Okay, yeah, they got their come up and so, so. But of course you realize in the process <laughs> that a lot of other people got hurt. And, um, but I think, Having lived in San Francisco as a monoculture and having seen, you know, the tech industry displace so much, I mean, artists and, you know, with what's going on there, that was kind of like a redemption for me to, to watch these <laughs> and binge on, on these shows. Okay, so I'm going to, I've, I've made notes and I'm going to look those up. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank if, you. If you had to uh, have your life in a reality TV show, which one would you like that to be? If I had my wife in a reality No, your life. Right. Your life. Oh, more, my <laughs> life. Oh, I thought, okay. Yeah. We've uh, created a wife for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I sort of like, part of me would say, you know, there's this show like Naked and Afraid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, I, my, the naked part, I, I, you know, I guess they do it to get viewers and so forth. So, you know, I'm not crazy about that, especially if it involves me, you know. Um, but, you know, they drop these people or these exotic locations and, the, mm. and then they, they have to, quote unquote, fend for themselves. And it, it's not like extreme, extreme survivalist, but it's just mm -hmm. enough that it has this social aspect. So, yeah, I guess I'm curious about that. I, I, if, if I could... <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, if, 
prove that I'm good at something else other than archives, you know, I would take that opportunity. <laughs> I like it. I like okay, it. I just watched an episode of this, and I would say oh, the did. survivalist piece of yeah. it, snakes and bugs and... Oh. Yeah, and the weight yeah. loss over the course. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Love the answer though. So, what <laughs> book? What book is on your nightstand right now? Okay, book. Uh, let's see. I have a couple going at the same time, just because you know, if you get, don't get satisfaction with one, then you kind of get back to the other one. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, one that I just finished was the Personal Librarian. And, and that's a great story written by two uh, uh, authors. And, and I actually was very curious about that, too, because I want to work with someone co-authoring something at some point, mm. And I was curious about how that would work. And so it's a story of the personal librarian to J.P. Morgan. So you might know Morgan Library, New ah. York, famous institution. But did you know that the first curator that put this all together and made an institution was a African-American woman that lived... Uh, actually, it was passing, basically, in the oh, early 20th century. Wow. It's such an interesting story. That he also, she also has a relationship with, with uh, J.P. Morgan, who is like 40 years old or something. So it's a little bit that, but mainly it's this amazing kind of story that nobody knew about. Interesting. Wow. Okay, that's definitely one to look up. Yeah. Okay, what a movie we all need to see right now? Okay, well, I'm, right now, there's not too much good stuff, <laughs> you know, but I would say if you can find it, it's probably streaming, a movie that kind of, you know, really got me excited, and I, you know, when I had kind of really been very cynical about the future of cinema, it was about 10 years ago, it's called The Tree of Life, I don't know if you have seen it, yeah. Um yeah. So it's this Terrence Malick who has done a bunch of other films, T Days of Heaven or The Thin Red Line and so forth. Uh, so he made this movie and it's, it's you know, very hard to discover. It's about, to, to describe. It's about the, the um, at the same time, the uh, uh, history of this family, which is his family. It's sort of slightly autobiographical. Uh, when he was younger and his brother, you know, committed suicide. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But also at the same time, it's about the history of the universe. So you see, you know, from the Big Bang to the far future when the Earth will, will cool and die out and so forth. So the, the way he made that back and forth between the, the, the microscopic and the universe, I mean, it, it is some, it's just the sheer ambition of it, I think. So the tree of life. Okay. okay. <laughs> Great recommendations. And our very last question. If sure. you had to commit to eating only one thing for the rest of your life, what would that be? Oh, I, I will say something that's Southern and yet it's not disingenuous, but uh, pimento cheese sandwiches. I think, <laughs> okay. I think <laughs> you know, I would happily, you know, kind of get my daily consumption of them for life, you know, I would, without anything else. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for all of the recommendations and- yes for sharing with us and all of the listeners a little bit more about your research and your scholarship. This has been incredibly insightful. Absolutely. Thank you guys for all your work and at the college and, and with this podcast. I'm looking forward to, to a new season. Absolutely. Thank you, Demetrios. <laughs> awesome. Have a good afternoon. You too. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.